Jarrett, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me on, brother. Yeah, glad to have you here. Uh, you know, you mentioned that I was on one of your earlier podcast episodes mm -hmm. back in the day when you're just kind of getting going. And uh, so I'm glad we're able to connect here on mine. Uh, I've been following you for a while. It's interesting, whenever some, some, uh, some guys come up, there's a lot of guys who have a passion to do what we do in terms mm -hmm. of helping men grow, especially from a Christian perspective. Um, and sometimes these guys sort of show up and they kind of peter out and that's it. And they, you know, it just wasn't for them and that's fine. So I always like to make sure like, who's going to do this well, who's really going to take it to the next level, who's serious about doing this as a long-term thing, because it's a big, it's a big commitment. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you grow over the years and it's been really cool, man. I, I like your brand. I like what you stand for. I like the boldness of, about what you talk about Christ mm -hmm. and uh, those kinds of things. So uh, good job. Good on you. And uh, thanks for sticking it through. So I think it'll be good. Good conversation today. Man, I agree. I, I literally was responding to a direct message on Instagram a second ago, and a guy was said, how do I grow a men's ministry page? And I'm like, first of all, you got to believe in your conviction. You have to believe in your message. If you're trying to attract a certain type of person and that's not who you are, yep. it ain't going to work. So it's just every day just working at it. Um, and, and it has to be who you are. And if it's not who you are, and it's just like a hat that you put on, you're going to fizzle out once the work really starts happening. And so, yeah, I appreciate that. Guys like you who lead the way and we just get to learn from you guys, man. It's such a blessing. Well, it's, it's, uh, things have gotten a lot different over the last probably, well, maybe three years or so growing anything on any mm -hmm. kind of social media platform or getting your name out there. Uh, because there are so many people just kind of in the waters, testing things out. You don't really know if, um, if there's somebody to follow or if they're just going to fizzle out at mm -hmm. some point. Not only that, but just um, things like following people hasn't happened the same. Like when I first started on Instagram, this was probably four or five years ago. I mean, getting getting followers like you know, like you know, shooting fish in a barrel. It was awesome. It was easy. Uh, now it's just like uh, people just don't follow like they used to. Yeah. Because there there's so much stuff to just constantly look at that just shows up on your radar or, or whatever, and people don't follow and connect. Social media has gotten a lot less social. It's gotten mm -hmm. a lot more um, salesy and that kind of stuff. So it's a challenge. And I, I tell people, actually, let me turn off my Slack. Hang on one second here. I tell people that uh, if they're going to get started today, they need to understand that it's not going to be uh, as easy of a process as it may have been a few years ago. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that you need to really be creative about mm -hmm. how you, what your approach is and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, and, and, and not to judge yourself by follower count anymore. I, I absolutely big, agree. That was a big thing back in the day. It was like, Oh, how many followers do I have? How, how, <laughs> how many people like my posts? That kind of stuff. It's like, look, forget about all that. Just, just mm -hmm. be social. Just be, just have fun. And like you said, if it's something that you love, you're just going, it's going to come up. You're going to do this anyhow. And, um, and mm -hmm. I think that's how you really know if it's, it's a fit for you. It's something you would be doing even if you, you know, if your follower counts, though, even if almost nobody's paying attention, it just happens. It's just going to be part of your, just your daily, who you are. And, and that's what I said. You know, I, who I am is, is, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor. So it's what I am on Sunday. It's what I am. If you and I are running into each other at a grocery store, we'll probably have a similar conversation that we're about to have right now. You know, and I think that's important because in that, in those early days, you're pretty much just talking to yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of, there's people feeling, yeah, there's, you know, there's some strange things that happen on social media. So you have to believe in, um, this is who I am. I, for a while there, I wasn't even using hashtags. I thought, you know what, if the almighty wants someone to follow this, they're going to, because I got, you're so into, you know, you're paranoid of algorithms and all this yeah. stuff. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put it out. And if the right person comes across it, great. Otherwise it's someone will find it eventually, or it's, it's something that the Holy Spirit's trying to teach me. And uh, you're absolutely right. It used to be, at least I, I was impressed. Someone had so many followers, whatever, and you meet them and you're like, okay, that isn't what I thought it was. So, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, all right, so before we get too far into this, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about Pursuit of Manliness, how you guys started, that kind of stuff, a little bit of your story. Take whatever time you want to take. People can fast forward if they don't like it. <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> well, the, the story begins with the, the the birth of my third son. I had two daughters, and I knew the responsibility as as a dad was just to protect them. That's, that's all I knew. And to be honest, um, I was married at that point for about – uh, what was it? 12 years. I'm now married for 20 years. So my son's eight, right. so I can do 20, 12 years. So, um, so I'm married for 12 years. I'm in ministry. I'm a children's pastor. I love working with kids and their parents and stuff, but, um, and I really had a heart for men, but I was pretty pathetic. I was pretty much just going through the motions and with this idea that somehow it magically gets better. There was no moral failures or anything like that. It was just a, a pretty pathetic existence. Uh, looking back on it, um, my son is born, 
uh, January 14, 2000, was that 13? Um, I'm terrible at math. That's why I'm a pastor. So uh, anyhow, he's eight now. I know that, but he's born on that day. And you know, when, when your kid is born, there's not a more vulnerable situation to be in, especially as a man, because I can do nothing about this. And uh, this particular instance, um, he's born and, you know, they flip him over and all that stuff. And you're like, yeah. easy. Uh, then they take, they said, I need you to come with me. We go into this elevator. We go upstairs. I didn't realize they had just um, ushered me into the NICU unit. Uh, yeah. And so he had a collapsed lung. He wasn't breathing. There were several things happening. And I, I sat in this little plastic chair and this nurse was trying to tell me what all the other nurses were doing. It was about four in the morning. It's all a blur. But I remember praying, as we often do when we find ourselves in a precarious situation, we're just firing off firework prayers. Yeah. I said, God, if you help this little boy fight, I'll fight. Which even in the moment, I thought that you're delusional because there was nothing in my life that I was really fighting for or fired up about. And through the course of about two weeks in the NICU, I know it's, there's people that have far worse stories, but two weeks in the NICU, eventually he gets out and we get home and, and you know, fast forward a couple years later, I'm watching him on like a step stool, put a ball in a basketball hoop. And I thought, man, this is really cool. A, a son doing what, what I enjoyed doing. Cause it just wasn't right. Throwing the football to my daughters and trying to get them to, you know, they just, they weren't down with it. And, uh, I would build Barbie dream houses and stuff for them, but it was as if God came and sat next to me. And I don't have many moments like this, but it was like, I, I heard those words. If you help this boy fight, I'll fight. And I thought we're about to get real uncomfortable. And for about two years, God just Rubik's cube my life. Mm. Um, I, I just felt a stirring. I started, um, I don't remember how I got to, Oh, I had a friend I was texting about. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a thing for men where we could talk about things that guys like, but as Christians and, I don't know what I was thinking. And I didn't know really what was out there. I'm not real savvy in social media. So I come up with the name, The Pursuit of Manliness. Um, we were texting back and forth. And then I thought, I don't even know what to do with this. So I started a Facebook page. I wasn't real confident in myself of starting this thing. So about 10 days later, I said something to my wife. I said, hey, I'm thinking about starting a Facebook. I had already started the page, so I'm lying here already. And uh, <laughs> my wife looked at me and said, if if you want to practice your manliness, our toilet's leaking right now. And I thought, oh, wow. that is that is that's, not that is not what I thought was going to oh, happen. I, yeah. I thought it was like when the Grinch brought the tree back to Whoville and they all stood around him and sang songs, you know, like my, our dad is, you know, and she's right. We, we need to be men of action. So I thought, OK, what is this going to look like? So I yeah. got a Weebly page and started blogging. I'm a terrible writer, but I thought that's all I know how to do. So I just started writing and I tried to post it. And from there, um, the pursuit of manliness is born. And God is like, you know, some people have that beautiful picture of God carrying you down the beach. I feel like God drags me down a gravel road is what is what happened to me. So uh, the pursuit is is my pursuit of just trying to be a better equipped man of God because I have a wife, I have children, I have people in my life who need me to get this right. And so that's the word. That's why pursuit was such an important word for me to start this thing that we're always striving. We're always being sanctified and becoming less like ourselves, more like Jesus. Yeah, no, that's really good, and uh, and I appreciate that story. It's a lot of um, a lot of great ventures are born out of just this sort of desire to do something. We don't really know where exactly we're going or how it's going to work out. It's just something we're pulled to, we're called to, and so your story sounds like that, similar to my story with Wolf and Iron, and uh, and Rustic in Maine, and we our mm -hmm. other business and stuff, things that we do. And, and a lot of times you don't really know what that, that end result is going to be or exactly where it's going. You just know there's something that you need to be a part of. And I think, um, I think for me, and I would imagine for you as well, the, uh, this call that we have to help men grow, it's really just, like you said, it's just part of our personal growth journey. It's, it's, in a sense, it keeps me accountable as well. It helps me to stay focused on like, what am I actually doing and why am I doing this? Um, there may be something about you that's that's pastoring by nature. So you, you, you do best your best personal work when it's also other people involved. I know I, I kind of mm -hmm. do that. Um, and maybe we're all kind of like that. And so uh, and I think that's just encouragement as well for guys out there who are going to start something. It doesn't matter what it is. Don't worry about where you're going to go or exactly how you're going to make it work or what it's going to be. Just know, yeah, if you feel called to get started, get started. You're going to learn something about yourself in that process. It may not be the final thing that you do, but it's going to be, it's going to help you grow into whatever that, that next, you know, uh, level is or next phase is. So I think that's really good. And go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and, and I think that's what we would tell guys starting out is 
and we were just talking about that. You, you got to find your voice. You know, I was yeah. fired up about, you know, Christian men. Like, how am I going to equip them? As a children's pastor, I saw these dads come in and they were apathetic and they get fired up about Little League, but their their, their spiritual life, there was nothing. You know, yeah. they, you know, every guy that came to me, every wife that drug her husband back to me in the children's ministry was like, hey, can he run tech? Um, because he couldn't lead a conversation with kids about Jesus. Or anything. Like, yeah, we'll put him in the tech booth, whatever. We'll yeah. find a spot for him. And so you get this passion, but I'm like, how do I convey that? How do I communicate that? And I wrote my first blog post in a Starbucks with like Christmas music blaring over my head next to a, a Taco Bell that got shut down for making meth. And it was about like seven ways to be manly at Christmas. You know, I was, and I thought, now what? Now what do I do with that? And so you're just getting your feet under you as you try to figure these things out. You can't microwave any of this. And yeah. if you do, it's not genuine. Right. You know, it's, it's not authentic. Yeah, and that's something that I think that that guys are drawn to is the journey of another man. It's something we actually don't get a chance to experience like we mm -hmm. used to probably. You know, we we used to be surrounded by community. We had dads, we had grandpas, we had mm -hmm. uncles, we had mm -hmm. all these other guys, cousins and different people like that. And it, and from all of them you could pull some aspect of their journey as a man and their growth. And you could even, you know, especially with the uncles, you could see all the bad things they're doing and the things sure. you don't want to do, right? Which is also a, a, a way of learning. But we don't have that introspective anymore. We don't have that um, that that same kind of relationship that we used to. At least not in. And most of us don't have that in our natural circles, just because we're all busy. People move. Um, you know, communities aren't what they used to be. Families aren't what they used to be. And so I think it's really important for for guys to be able to see you, see me, other guys that are doing similar things, mm -hmm. and say, I'm not just telling you about the stuff that I know. I'm actually bringing you on this journey with me. As I screw up as a as a husband, as I screw up as a father, as I have wins as a husband or as a father, as a leader, as a business, whatever, um, I want to I want you guys to experience those things, because you know as we've all heard, more is caught than taught, mm -hmm. and uh, and we can actually catch a good bit um, just by watching guys and, and kind of following along with their story. Um, this isn't a I write a book, I, I share the information with you, and you get it all. This is a I kind of bring you into the fold. You understand a little bit more about how I operate, and hopefully, I'm pointing back to Christ and I'm pointing back to good things, um, and not just myself because that could be dangerous as well. And that's what I learned I, the, early on. I wanted to have all, I had all these ideas of what I was going to write about and do, and and here I am starting at a place where I don't. For the first year plus, I did it anonymously because I didn't feel like who am I to even have this conversation with anybody? Cause I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah. And then it got to a point where I realized, you know what? I'm just like a lot of guys. I'm just trying to learn this. I have a strong conviction about this. Um, I don't profess to be anything than what I am, but I, I have a, a conviction. So I'm going to do, I'm almost like John the Baptist. I'm going to do something about it. It may not be the way that other people do it. And that's okay. And what I found was like you, there are guys drawn to authenticity. We're, yeah if I give you the impression I have it all figured out, I, I've lied to you. That is not the case, but I'll tell you what, I've learned some things and because I don't have it figured out, I'm smart enough to know that my natural inclination is to be a lone wolf. I can't survive like that. Yeah. I can't survive as a lone wolf. I have to be connected to a pack to some degree. I'm confident enough in myself that I don't have to have the pack, but I know one-on-one -on -one I'll be destroyed if I remain there. And so yeah. I thought, then I got to get surrounded by better people. I need to find these people. And that is the beauty of social media. When you use it the right way, you can yeah. expedite that process pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can, if we're stuck to with just kind of like the people we grew up with or in our hometown or whatever the case may be, yep. we might not have that influence that we that we really need as men of guys that are on a, uh, they also don't have anything, have it all figured out, but they're at a higher caliber than we may just naturally have grown up yep. with or surrounded ourselves with, with social media, we can make connections. We can start to now have, um, you know, guys that are a couple states away, but those guys can be pouring into our lives and talking to us and stuff like that. And I'm always a fan of local connections as much as possible. So butts in seats, guys, eyeball to eyeball, yeah. having coffee together, uh, doing life together, um, those kinds of things. But, you know, there's there's also something to be said about just really being built up. If you're intentional about social media and all that, intentional about your use of it, it can be a good thing for sure. Absolutely. Life on life where someone can speak to you and say, man, you seem off or boy, you, you have not showed up to these things, these last three things. And that's yeah. not normal. That's good. But also the beauty of, of social media is one, we get to have this connection and other guys, you know, someone in an earbuds far away that you and I have never met. will hear this conversation yeah. and we'll, they'll be blessed or equipped because of that. And any time of the day or night, there is that community there. There are yeah. people you know, that you can lean into, that you can get prayer from, that you can learn from. Um, I think it was 
we were on the way to St. Louis airport for something and you had posted, I think it was your microphone or something you had bought. And I was, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I felt like I wanted to do a podcast again, anonymously, that's not a good strategy, but I looked at your picture and I thought, Oh, if that's what the items are, then I at least know where to start because I didn't, I didn't even know where to start. I see your and, uh, a Yeti microphone there. Yeah, got. well, I had to buy a couple junk ones before I got oh, to a, a better one. <laughs> I love this microphone. Yeah, I bought one from my office too. Now, what you got is real nice. But, but learning from that and say, okay, well, then I want to be a resource for someone else too. So if there's that guy out there that says, "Man, I don't know what to do," let me tell you what I've learned. Yeah. And let me let me help you out, and hopefully you surpass me, and you've become far more advanced or better than I am. I'm just, we're on the same team here. Yeah, uh, a couple of guys and myself are going through Jordan Peterson's new book, 12 Rules for Life, or 12 More Rules for Life Beyond Order. And uh, there's a piece in there he says is really, really good. He, he's, he's got a couple of things that he explains just so well. And one of the things he talks about is um, is that there's there's an aspect of tradition. There's an aspect of being the apprentice for a while and, and mm. kind of subjecting yourself to just the way things are done so that you can gain the knowledge enough to be in a position of a master, a sense, Mm. And, and then really begin to think outside the box. You kind of got to know what's in the box, how the box works to be able to think outside it. And I think that's where we start, whether it does, whether you're beginning a podcast, you're writing a book, you're, you're learning how to play an instrument or whatever. We all kind of start from like, how are things done today? You know, uh, and the same could be said about living life as a man, being a father, being a husband. It's sort of like, well, what's, what's the traditional ways that, that are known to kind of work and be successful Maybe I should learn about those things, and then I can start thinking outside the box and, and you know, kind of come up with my own spin on things here and there if it's necessary. But I think you know a lot of times we we think that we've got to be so new or we've got to be so different. We've got to do we've got to bring so much you know uniqueness to to the field. And a lot of times, no, it's just you just need to show up and do the work. And um, there there are already plenty of proven ways of of you know accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. So. Um, I want to jump into something here. Mm -hmm. So uh, occasionally, so we both do um, ministries in a sense or missions, I guess, in a sense. Yours is, um, I think yours has a much more vocal kind of presence about being biblical manliness, biblical manhood. Mine's a little bit more nuanced, um, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine with Wolf and Iron. Uh, but a lot of guys, because they would see pursuit of manliness or they'd see Wolf and Iron, and it doesn't say like Jesus guys, <laughs> they wouldn't know until they started to kind of get involved a little bit. And then they would go, Oh, wait a second. This is a Christian thing. Mm -hmm. And some of the guys that I run into, they're like, Mike, I like what you talk about. I like the, the, the lessons that you give and that kind of stuff. But then you talk about Christianity and you talk about Jesus and you talk about, uh, you know, these kinds of things. Why do I need to be, and this is the question, why do I need to be a Christian in order to be a good man? And so I thought we maybe we could spend a little bit of time talking about that because I don't know if your your perspective on it is different with the guys that, that show up, you know, um, for pursuit of manliness. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Like, why is it necessary? Uh, why do we push Christianity, biblical um, manhood, versus just like, just be a good dude? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because when the pursuit of manly, I started a closed group and I had, no, I've never, I don't even know if I had been in a closed group. I asked seven guys that I knew, would you be in it? Cause I didn't know yeah. how it worked. And all of a sudden it started to grow. And I remember one guy in, in particular, he, um, and I've never met this guy. He, he was in there for about eight hours and I made a post. It was something, and I know the name Jesus was in it yeah. because that's what really lit him up. And he said, Oh, I thought this was a group about manliness, not Jesus. And I'm like, well, this is a great conversation topic. So, <laughs> Um, the idea is, I think we all, especially in our day and age right now, all believe we have an element of goodness in us, right? So if we use the term good, we'll say, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good you know, husband, father, you know, like even the guy you know, I was saying 13 years ago, eight years ago, pretty good guy. Um, like Jesus identified when they called him a good teacher. Well, who's actually good, but God alone. So by what standard are we considering something a, a, a citizen that is uh, worthy of, of being recognized or someone that is adding value to. And I think what we get the idea of Christianity, we get what our culture has decided what Christians are. And they're usually kind of nerdy. They're eager. Yeah. They're either legalist or they're Passover or, mm -hmm. you know, or they're, um, you know, pushovers or they're kind of these wimpy dads who are, um, or you take the extreme version of Christianity and the people who, um, you know, in the news telling you how bad everything is. And then you find out they have secret sins. Listen, yeah, yeah. we all have sins. We all have things that we wish we would not have done. Now, maybe the, the person listening wouldn't call it a sin. They'd call it why well, I messed up. I've made some mistakes. That's fine. The Bible calls it sin. It says that we've, we've all done it. We all fall short of God's glory. God has an incredible plan 
for all of us. God has an incredible purpose for all of us. We're going to realize it in different formats, but the Bible gives us the answers to, to the questions here on earth. Like, how did we get here? Okay, what, what are we doing here? Well, Genesis 126 tells me every single one of us is created in the image of God. So whether I live in America or another country, whether I'm, you know, white, black or anything, whether whatever my political party, whatever my affiliation is, I, I have to realize I'm created in the image of God. Well, that doesn't give me then that tells me I don't have permission to hate or look down on anybody. And so when we go with just being good or just doing my good deed of the day, what it tells me is I know there's enough goodness in me. Therefore I must see the badness in you. So I have to yeah. fix what's bad in you. The Bible tells me we all got the badness in us. Yep. What we need is Jesus and Jesus is the one that forgives us of our sins. He gives us immortality, gives us eternal life. And so you say, I can't, I don't, I would never want to talk anyone into Christianity. I would never want to talk anyone into following Jesus. I'm going to tell you about him. And I'm going to tell you most of the things you probably know about him are probably not accurate because you got to get in the word of God. I find that most guys that I find, they're not really in the Bible or there'll be that guy that said, well, I've read the Bible front to back. And let me tell you, well, big deal. You, you know, big, you I've read a lot of books yeah. front to back, yeah. you know, like, Okay, congratulations. But if you read it just to, you know, as, as a historical book or a book of stories, yeah, you're going to miss it. Um, you know, Hebrews talks about it's living and active. So what we do is get in, get in the word and realize there ain't a lot of goodness in us. And we're, we are far more broken than we're ever going to realize or yeah. even admit. We are more insecure. We are more cynical. We are, you know, we, we do have these things. I remember Years ago, a guy sitting in front of me asking me, hey, man, how's your heart? And he was a pastor, and he was trying to do some pastoring to me. What happened was he ended up having a moral failure. No, he wasn't guarding his own heart. He was worried about my heart, but he wasn't worried about his own heart. The Bible answers those questions, and it helps us understand that uh, goodness is only found in Jesus. But if we make Jesus flannel graph, or we make him cartoony, or we make him something goofy, yeah, I get it. You know, I've said before, heaven needs a new PR firm because we get the idea of heaven is babies on a cloud yeah. playing a harp. And I'm like, I ain't and, signing up for that. No, and hell is like that. cornhole and music and beer and tailgating. <laughs> yeah, right. No, neither one of those are accurate. Right, yeah. No, yeah, <laughs> 100% agree on that. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying with the, the the Christianity side of things. There's a there's something that I hear, and, and, I, and I get the idea behind this, which is um, be better than the guy you were yesterday. Okay, I get that. But it's also like saying, well, I got to be better than the worst version of myself. And that's like, mm -hmm. well, that's if I'm, if what I call good is always some negative thing, then what am I actually shooting towards? I'm just basically comparing myself to the worst version of myself. Hopefully I'm better than, than the worst version of me. But if I, if I see Christ and I say, okay, here's perfection in, in manhood, here's perfection in, um, in holiness and in all these other things. Well, now I'm actually, I've actually got something that I'm shooting for. I've actually got an example out there ahead of me, not just the things that I'm trying to not be or run from. And a lot of, I think, um, where Christianity gets its modern Christianity or a lot of what, what we feel about it, where we get the, the kind of the wimpiness nature or the, the men aren't manly and they're kind of effeminate and you know those kinds of things is because we focus so much on the, the negative qualities of people, of who we are rather than espousing towards, you know, who Christ is and, you know, the, the, the positive qualities of manhood. And, um, and I think that that's, that's key. I think that there's, we've, we've done so much work trying to, um, make sure people don't sin and, uh, and have a focus of, did you sin? Did you not sin? Did you do bad? Did you not do bad? That we really miss the opportunity to say, Hey, we've got an awesome savior who set the example for us. Let's run the race towards that instead of, you know, trying to run away from, you know, the old self and those kinds of things. And I think that's a big difference too, is that relative goodness. Yeah, you, you can be a good dude. You can be a good dad and not be a Christian. You can be, depending on what good means, do you want to be great? Do you want to overcome some of the challenges? Do you want to heal some of those heart wounds and those kinds of things that are a lot of times that cause generational problems to just reoccur and reoccur? Mm -hmm. Well, let's get Christ in there because he does healing. Um, you want to have an example of what it means to be uh, a, a, a father 
you know, that, that loves even when he's challenged and, and overcomes it. Let's get Christ in there, you know. Um, let's stop trying to look around for other guys necessarily that, that you know, set that example perfectly. And that's what we say. You got to get to Jesus. Don't get religion. Don't get a denomination. Don't get a tradition. And I know that's our natural inclination. Well, I grew up in the so-and-so church. I must go there. You got to get to Jesus. You know, Jesus, we either like Jesus with like the sheep around his neck and patting kids on the head or the guy flipping over tables. Yeah. You know, like God gave us more than just a couple of emotions. He, yeah. You get the Jesus who said cringy things all the time. You get the Jesus who no matter what anyone thought he should do, did what was right. You did Jesus who spoke truth. I mean, when you look at Jesus, it's not the way we typically portray him in our culture. We'll tell guys that like, I'm telling you, we have done a terrible job through the last 2000 years of selling who Jesus is. Look at the book of Acts. Those guys literally gave their life for this message, stood in front of rulers and authorities, were beaten, chained, shipwrecked, the whole deal. They said, doesn't matter. Well, I'm telling you what, that guy is real and he is alive. Yeah. And I think we have to do a better job of conveying that. Now, the other side of that is because we've done a bad job of portraying who Jesus is, we look for manliness in the manliest guy we can find. It doesn't matter who it is. Whoever seems to have the bark, whoever seems to have the presence, whoever seems to have the following, we're like, that's my guy. What you need to remember is that's a carbon copy. No matter what, you and I are carbon copies. So if you try to follow me, I'm going to lead you down. I'm going to get you closer to Jesus, but you got to find him yourself. And we, yeah. you and I have both been gifted with different talents and abilities. That guy with, you know, that has that loud bark or that guy that has that platform or that guy, God's gifted him too. Not everyone's called to be an overseas missionary, but we're all called to live on mission. Yeah. We're not all called to preach the gospel, but we are all called to make disciples or be prepared to give a defense for what we believe. The way we realize that or exercise that looks different. Some people are better up front. Some people are better behind the scenes. You got to get to Jesus. If you get to Jesus, you realize he has uniquely wired me for his purpose. And it gives me a purpose here on earth. And I realize, listen, I'm not going to live forever. So one of these days I'm going to end up in the ground. What's going to happen to me? Well, the Bible tells me that in Christ, I live forever. Immortality, my sins are forgiven. I'll take that any day, any day over trying to project that I'm something that I'm really not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100% agree on that. And I think a lot of our, our Jesus uh, kind of narratives that we have, it, it, I don't know if it just comes from a religious standpoint, but it's, it's, our, it's our, we're trying to put him into a, understand him, put him in a box. He's either nice Jesus, you know, telling poetry and patting kids on the heads, and, uh, or he's, you know, like he's, yeah, he's flipping over tables or he's doing one of those things. Truth is, he was, he was human in his, in his own way and complex and also a deity, mm -hmm. but also, you know, like living life as a guy here on earth, on mission. And that's a complex thing to understand. It takes a lot more to understand that than it does to try and think, I want to be flipping over tables, Jesus. That's the guy that I want. Or I want right. to be cute, sweet baby Jesus. That's the one I want to know about. You know, this it, it takes a lot more to really understand that complex depth of nature than it does to um, and then to try to spin kind of this, this image or a almost a fictional version of him that would fit into our minds. And... Um, yeah, I mean, understanding Christ is really a lifelong pursuit because He is so dynamic, and um, and and has, has you know did so much, um, you know, with His life. And so it's yeah, I agree with that. I, I love Jesus who calls out hypocrisy. I feel like that's a yeah. spiritual gift I have. I love to call out hypocrites, but then that's the Holy true. Spirit tells me you're a hypocrite. That's right. You know what? You did say that, but your attitude isn't that. Or that's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of who God. it keeps you in perspective. Like, you know what? I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not, I have, there are times that you have to speak truth. There are times that you do call out sin. Absolutely. There are times that you also show grace and love. The gospel encompasses all those things. And again, that's why we do what we do. Cause perhaps someone will get a different image of the gospel that we hope is, is accurate. And they'll say, I never heard of it that way. I never saw it that way. The church I grew up in, the, my, my relatives, my church tradition, whatever. It wasn't anything like that. I'm not trying to reinvent anything. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm just trying to tell you, get to Jesus. You may not like the way I do it, but perhaps you'll find another guy that tells it to you differently. We just want you to get to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've got another thing to add here, and then, I'll, then we'll swap, switch over to um, something else. There's a, uh, I was going to write this in, in my in my upcoming book, but I just couldn't make it quite fit. But it's, a, it's kind of a neat idea, something I kind of thought about while I was writing it. And that is, so often in stories, especially like 80s, you know, movies and stuff like that 
the hero of the story was always like the most unqualified person. He would be like the <laughs> kid who's a nerd and, you know, he had nothing going on in life, but he had probably a good heart or something like that. And then he would find like an amulet or he would stumble upon a scroll or he would find a, a you know, something that gave him the ability to become a hero. Whereas the villain was always the guy seeking the thing out. Like the villain was the guy that was like, I'm looking for the lost jewel. I'm looking for the whatever. And I think it painted this narrative for us, uh, for guys who are of our generation, that heroes, they become heroes just kind of accidentally. It just sort of happens. And villains, if you're a villain, if you're actually pursuing something, you know, pursuing mm. manliness, you're mm. a villain if you're actually eager to, to obtain something. And one of the things I noticed about Christ is that he was like, man, no, I'm on mission. Mm -hmm. I'm going after this thing. I'm seeking uh, to do good here. And, you know, I, I have my, you know, my, my goal of what I'm, what I'm going to, what that's going to look like. It's not going to lead to a typical kind of victorious hero in, but it's really going to ep ep epitomize what being a hero actually looks like. And, uh, but he did it on mission. He, he knew what he was about. He knew what he was going for. He wasn't the, I mean, yes, he was born poor and all that kind of stuff, but he didn't consider himself uh, like, oh, I'm a lowly kid. And then God just kind of hit him with like a magic bolt of like, you know, <laughs> now you're Jesus. It didn't work like that. You know, and I thought just how different yeah. his story is from the typical kind of hero story that were painted. Um, and, you know, and, that, and, and a lot of men, I think, they're just sort of expecting life to just sort of line up for them, the, to be given the, you know, rewarded with something out of the blue to become the hero of their story. And Christ is like, like saying, no, man, I got a mission for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get to be one of the heroes of your story and, uh, and come along and, and, and pursue this thing. And you got to be intentional about it. But it's, it's, not, um, it's certainly not a villainous act for us to desire good things and desire to be the hero and to stand out in our own story. I think it's what we're called to. Yeah, I've said that before. Maybe I don't word it the best way, but I would say, you know, Mike, if you don't want to be the absolute best at what you do, you should do something else especially if you're working for someone and there'll be people who really get upset. Like it's a prideful thing. It's well, if I don't want to be the absolute best at what I do day in and day out, why am I doing, I'm stealing money. I'm wasting time. And we don't, time is finite. It's very precious. And Jesus didn't let things distract him from his mission. You know, he, he was, he was, he said, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself, but it'd be like you and I, we had it set time to be on this call. If the phone would have rang or someone come to the door and I'm out there, you're going to say, this ain't a value to him. You know, so when you when something is a value, you're locked in and you create a plan of action and then you realize that plan of action. If you don't, it really wasn't a value. It was it was a pipe dream. And and Jesus gives that example. And again, get to him, learn from him. And then you read the epistles, you read Paul and Peter and James. What are they teaching you? They're teaching what Jesus taught them and it teach you how to live this faith out. And um, man, if you get in the word, get to Jesus. It changes everything. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Tribe, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing about this. Uh, so we've got something called the Foundry that we haven't launched yet, but we've been thinking about. And uh, when I say we, mostly just me. I get uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> we as in Wolf and Iron, but I get it. Yeah. You know, pretty much me. Uh, just thinking about how's this Foundry thing going to work? Well, we're making progress mm -hmm. on it, but we're not, we, we haven't kicked it off yet. But you've been doing something called Tribe, mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, I like, I, I like to see what other guys come up with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that just that kind of works for their model. And uh, tell us a little bit about what that is, how it works, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the guys or how, kind yeah. of what you guys are doing in there. So Tribe originally is not what it is now, which is funny how those things work. What yeah. I thought it was going to be is nowhere near what it is, but I had this tension at some point about a year and a half into this thinking, year and a half into Pursuit of Mainly, it's like, I don't want to just put out content. I don't want to just put out images on a you know, picture and post. I mean, it's fun. It's good. And, but there needs to be some meat and potatoes. There needs to be something where we're really growing guys. That was a conviction. So I remember make, making a post. It was probably at the end of like 2017 or something like that. And I said, what do you need in the following year to really grow you as a man? And one guy in, in particular said, I need friends. I need some relationships, you know, and he's a dude. I mean, he wasn't some guy that just uh, needs, some, you know, um, and I felt like there was a moment where like the Holy Spirit's pushed me out of the airplane going, it's time. And yeah. so, um, I reached out to a guy that worked with me, a few other guys, and we got 10 guys together. And I said, I, I, I feel like we're going to call this thing tribe. I had an idea. I mean, I just worked, you know how it is, you get an idea and I worked like feverishly. It was the only thing I thought about for yeah. a period of time. I'm printing off copies. I'm trying to do all this stuff. And we had 10 guys and within like the first two weeks, five of the guys quit. It was free. And I thought we are off to a great start here. So we had about five guys 
we decided it was going to be a, so I kept tweaking it. And I always say we're in the now and the next. So I'm looking at the now what's happening. I'm looking at the next one. So essentially tribe is a six month discipleship community within the pursuit of manliness. There's guys that get in tribe. They have no idea what pursuit of manliness is, which yeah. I think is awesome. I yeah, think it's great how that too, works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I tried to connect it to that. Like, Hey, this is, they don't care. So it's fine. Um, but the idea is there's, there's daily Bible reading. We get, we lay that out. There's um, we, st- we give them like this field guide and here's your reading. Uh, we do weekly challenge videos. We do zoom calls. Uh, we have a covenant in the beginning. There's a lot of very moving pieces that go along a tribe. And we've, we try to make a podcast probably about once every six months just to say, this is what it is and kind of pull the curtain back. I'll tell guys, there's no secret sauce to this. There's no like, well, if you just do these things, I had a guy reach out and go, can I have your covenant? And I said, no, because here's why I'm constantly tweaking it and it yeah. wouldn't fit you. Like it yeah. would like some half of it would go, I don't understand what he's saying. We modified all the time. And so these guys sign up right now we have 80 guys in this current session of tribe registrations open for the next one. We open it twice a year. So basically we hit reset. Every guy has the opportunity to say, do I want to stay in or not? Uh, some guys, you know, why don't you make it a monthly thing? You, you'd make more money and get more guys because we want guys to commit over the long haul. And we yeah. feel like six months is long enough without making it arduous. You sign up for a college class. You want it to end at some point. Yeah. Um, and you look at your season of life. So these guys sign up. Some guys are hot and heavy within the first two weeks and then they're gone, you know? Um, But what's neat is seeing life on life that's happening. We're seeing men go out of their way to meet up with one another too. We just had a guy from California do a thing called tribe travels. He met up with 20 different guys and tribe in the Midwest over his spring break. That's great. He made his own little private Facebook group where he posted pictures every day where he was traveling. And so what's happening is tribe in many ways, these guys is a supplement to what they feel like is missing in their local church and some of them now with COVID aren't even in churches and stuff. So it doesn't replace your church. We're not a denomination We're you know, we got guys from all different walks. You don't have to be a theologian to be in this group by any means. I'm not a theologian. Um, we got guys who are in their infancy as far as understanding faith. And we got guys have been probably believers longer than I've been alive. Yeah, no, that's great, man. And, and I like that. Um, uh, it's, there's an iterative aspect to it where you get a chance every six months or, or so to kind of change things up and go, what do we do well? What do we do differently? Mm-hmm. What's God calling us to for this next season? You know, six months, whatever it happens to be. Mm-hmm. How do we make it better? You know, getting feedback from the guys. So I think that's really, that's really, really key. Um, so you guys are going through the, like, like a discipleship type of thing. I know you guys have some books that you read as well, or is it, is it, is it a couple of books over a, the period of six months or is it like one book? How do you guys do that? We've done two books. Um, I, I'm a book guy. Yeah. So for me, I was like, let's just load them up with books. Well, some guys haven't read a book since high school. So to tell them to read a book is a little daunting. Some guys read the whole book in the first week and other guys are like, I'm so far behind. So what we did was just do one book right now. Uh, we did Patrick Morley's book, how God makes men. Um, I break it up over the six months. Okay. This week or no, these two weeks, you just read this chapter. Uh, we try to incorporate some of the discussions or challenges around the book just to keep guys anchored to that. Um, but I mean, nearly every day we have a closed Facebook group nearly every day. There's guys posting about the scripture or asking questions. Sometimes we're all jumping in. Here's what we think. Sometimes we're all like crickets. We don't know. Um, (laughs) So it's, it's nobody trying to flex on nobody. I've had people get in thinking they're going to come sit at my feet and learn from me. Like my kids don't even do that. So what we want to do is make it very uh, circular as far as everybody learns from everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I got some things to add, but man, I'll tell you what, getting around, as you just said, high caliber, high character men, it changes you. Yeah. And, and um, one of the neatest things to come from tribe is to hear what some of the wives are starting to say, what they're seeing in their husband. Oh, yeah. Cause it's one thing to have like a little, you know, man cave, right? Like we have our little holy huddle and we're, you know, scratching, sniffing and burping and it's all great. We all, we do some of that too, but to see the impact it's making in their home, that's, that means that guy is doing what he says he's doing. And, and that's, that's huge. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's definitely what, what we want to hear. Is that because you know if, if he's having an impact in his home, he's having a generational impact. So it's yes. not just oh he's he's figured out his career path or he's figured <laughs> out you know uh, how to lose weight and keep it off or whatever the case is. Those are all good things. If he's having an impact in his home, kids are seeing that. Uh, his wife's seeing that. Neighbors are seeing that. Friends are seeing that. He's having a generational impact in his family and probably on his community as well. So yeah, absolutely key. Yeah, if you lose fifty pounds, your kids hate you. I'd rather you be overweight and your kids love you. I'd, I'd rather go with that. So you're right. It is about leaving something to like one of the challenges we've, we've done the last couple of years, I feel like around December ish is we challenge the guys to write a letter 
to someone in their family, like handwrite a letter to them and, and then come back and share. And some guys refuse to share. Like they're just like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not fair enough. But I'll tell you what, when I do that and the guys that share the stories, it's phenomenal. And when I hand that letter to my wife and kids, I give it to them every year at Christmas. I put some cash in there too, just in case the letter doesn't sure land. But up, yeah. yeah, that's right. I want, I want them to see some green, but I'll hand them the letter. They all read it privately. They all go to their own place and they all keep it. And I'll see it every once in a while in my son's room or something. And uh, what we're trying to do is just stir that in a guy. I can't tell you how to kindle the fire in your life, Mike, but I can show you where the kindling is. And I can show you like, here's how you do it. And now you can keep that going. Uh, Guys take sessions off. Often they come back like, man, I needed some community. Um, They bring guys into it. There's guys paying for other guys like, hey, man, I want to pay for this dude or I'm trying to get this guy in. Um, it's just really neat to see what God does with guys who are willing to be used in incredible ways. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's great. Talk a little bit about some of the things that as the guys come into tribe that they're dealing with that, that you're like, man, this is, this is something that we need to solve for men. You know, what are, what are they missing in their life? What are they not getting from their local church? Like you said, a lot of guys aren't going to church. I'm not really going to church these days because mask issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, nah, but, uh, you know, church is never really a good fit for me. Anyhow, that'd take us down a rabbit tra- rabbit trail. But the the main thing is, what what are the guys not getting from you know uh, you know from, from from life outside of tribe that they they're like, man, I need this. I'm finding it here. What are, what are some of the struggles they got? I'd say the top. There's two top ones. One would be loneliness. Men are lonely. We won't admit it. That sounds really weak for me to say that, right? Like when I was younger, that was something you, you made fun of your friends. Like you have no friends. You know, um, they 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 don't. You know, and we, we believe the lie that, you know, I'm working, I'm providing, I'm whatever, I'm good. And as I said, I'm, my natural inclination is I'm good. You know, when you tell me shelter in place, you don't got to tell me twice. I love to stay home and do what I do. I, I, I thrive in that. It's not good, though, to remain in that way. You have to have community. And guys come to Tribe desperate for community. Some of them will even admit it because you know, there's some guys that won't you're like we know you, you've done this long enough you know like you yeah. can read people yeah. so they desperately need that and here's the other thing that's connected to that there's an addiction and it's more than likely pornography or it's alcohol or it's something and we've had guys you know just say this is what it is this is what's going on in my life and they have told nobody else and they tell they've said listen i've seen guys work through that going they're telling you they're jumping out of that plane and they can't believe they're saying it yeah um we don't mock them. We don't we're like, we get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's the beauty of some of this online stuff. You're like, Oh, how real can it be? Well, all the pretense is knocked down. You're a mess. I'm a mess. We're all a mess. Great. Well, let's, let's figure this thing out. By the time you meet each other, we already know. Now the guy to your left or right in church, you're not going to tell him anything. Yeah. Cause he might and tell your it, wife or he may, you know, make judge you behind the scenes or now you're getting gossiped about or whatever. Who, who knows? He's going to look at your kids different. You know, you have a win at, at work. He's like, yeah, but you're, you know, and, and and so we try to say, listen, we we get it. Again, we're not a denomination or anything weird like that. We're just guys. We're just yeah. guys who love Jesus, all different walks. We have some really hard conversations and we have some light ones. We did one like, you know, what is your everyday carry? I'm surprised the ATF wasn't swarming around some of these guys' houses by the time <laughs> they posted their everyday carry. Yeah. They're a little creepy, but um, no, it's just about like, Look, man, you got this stuff. We know it. Stop, stop pretending like you don't. And, and not every guy's addicted to porn. Not every guy's an alcoholic. Not every, but we all have insecurities. We all have things that didn't go well in our life. We all have some issues somewhere, and they all look different. And you say, well, I don't. Great. Then we desperately need you because we have a lot of guys who do. And what happens is I've seen guys that have been in there for two, two and a half years and finally admit to something in their life. And you're like, man, you were here for two years seeing all these new guys come in all the time. And and it's just, there's a fear. There's a yeah. fear that if I'm real, will they look at me different? Yeah, we'll look at you better. Yeah. Because we go, yeah, you're like me. We get it. And the fear that now I've got to deal with it. Now that I put it well, out there, it's on the table. I, not only are you guys judging me, but I'm judging myself. and I got to deal with it or, you know, or just, uh, j- just say, I'm going to stay here like I am. I'm not willing to change. Yeah, I'm going to live like this. We, I'll like tell you guys that. If you ask for accountability, be careful because it's like some Rottweilers. These guys will hit you up. They'll get on the phone. They'll, you know, like, oh, I want to, no, a lot of guys don't want accountability. They want like a life coach. Just tell me what, I'm oh, sorry. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to eat. Just tell me when to go to bed. We're not running a daycare for dads. If no. you want accountability, it means you're willing to put in the work and we're going to follow up with you and say, how that went, how'd that go? We were praying for a guy today who had a major phone call he had to deal with. And so later on today, probably before lunch, we'll find out 
how that went. And, and that's the beauty of things like this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know with, uh, with Wolf and Iron, it's been surprising. We, we ask guys about once a month, kind of what they're dealing with. Anxiety is always way up there. Uh, surprises me actually. And, and I'm not by nature an, an anxious guy. I just, I got a lot of things that I just do. And I don't know, maybe that's how I deal with it. I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm not by nature an anxious guy. And I always just assume most guys are just kind of easy going, laid back, you know, whatever. But the, the, the number of guys who are dealing with anxiety today, and a lot of this has to do with they're listless in life. They don't know what their mission is. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have friends. They don't, uh, they have way too much time on their hands to think about things and overthink about things. They've got some addictions, which are probably driving it as well. And, um, you know, then bad lifestyle all around food and who, who knows what else. But I was always just really surprised. Like the anxiety is so high up there. And a lot of guys, uh, anxiety is sort of like the, um, here's the, here's the, the, the uh, what do I want to say? This is the, uh, the result of something that's an underlying issue. And one of the things that we can do, and I'm sure you guys do this in tribe is like, I need to help you kind of get to that root. Like, what are you actually dealing with? You say anxiety, but that just, what does that really mean? Well, no, I've got a fear because I, I I'm 45 years old and I'm not married and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Hey, let's get that out there on the table and start talking about that because yeah. You know, uh, why are you where you are, you know, and, and what does God have planned for you and those kinds of things. But I think that that's, those are the kind of conversations that guys are really desperate to have. Uh, as much as we like to talk about how guys don't like to have conversations about emotions, there are a lot of guys out there that are like, man, I need s something's wrong inside of here and inside of up here. I need to talk about it. I need some guys I can trust to do that with. And I need guys that I can do, do things with as well, but I need some guys mm -hmm. that I can really talk through some stuff and trust. And, um, cause once again, we don't have those uncles, grandfathers, you know, cousins, whatever, to really coach us and guide us through life. And we're missing out on that. Absolutely. And what happens when you continue to miss out on it? Your world gets really, really small and really, really fragile. And more than likely, again, there's a sin issue there. There's something in your life that you know isn't good. Now, whether you call it sin or not, that that's irregardless right now. It's that you know it's not good. And so you're trying to hide it. Men with that are unaccountable for their time and unaccountable with money and resources always find themselves in trouble. They will always be doing things that they know in their heart isn't right. So the more you do that, the more anxious you get. Well, what is that? That sense, what God told Cain in Genesis four, sin is crouching at your door. It tries to look really small. It wants to rule over you, but you must master it. And he tells Cain, if you do well, it's going to go well for you. If you do what is right or mm -hmm. well, what is right, what's well, getting back to our creator and understanding we're created for a, we're not, we're here to exist. Mike, God didn't wake us up today for you and I just to exist, mm -hmm. to take up space. He doesn't need us. We're irrelevant to the story. If that's the case, he woke us up today because he has purpose. He breathed life into our nostrils while we slept last night. He kept your, your home from, you know, catching on fire, all the variables that happened in the universe. So you and I could be up today. It's not because we're that awesome. It's because he has something for us and we need to, we walk in that. So we tell guys, you know, slow down, calm down, look up. Okay. Just slow down, stop, just turn off the noise, calm down, get outside. You got to get outside. Yep. What happened during COVID? Everybody went inside. They shut the blinds and they lived on TV. Mental health is just crashed. Yep. I saw Shaq the other day said how, what a horrible rough year it was emotional. I'm, I just told the guy, <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal, who has everything. Could you imagine the numbers that are in his cell phone? He could have spent a different day in a different room in his house. He could have bought everything from Amazon. Yeah. And that guy was overwhelmed and, and anxious. None of us are immune to this. So we have to get outside, go get in creation, go for a walk, sit in your backyard, sit on your porch, sit on your neighbor's porch. That'll be fun for a while. I mean, whatever you need to do, just get out and then get around good community. If there are guys who are hurting your marriage, they're not your friends. If yeah. there are guys who are hurting your, your walk with Christ, they're not your friends. And if, if your wife is against them, they're definitely not your friends. So get around good people. And that's the beauty of like Zoom or whether you have good accountability or small groups. When you go there, your wife is like, good. I'm glad you're going, yep. right? That's a, if she's fighting you, probably not a good thing. So you're right. We do have this anxiety. And so then our fear is, well, then I have to do something about it. Well, when I get anxious, I remember I ain't in control of anything. So you know, what? why am I anxious? Because I'm trying to control something that was never mine to control to begin with. Well, then my world gets pretty fragile if I try to control it all. And, and that's what that's the lie people have believed, that if you just do all these things, you'll be safe. Well, what what is is that safe? Is existing safe? I, I don't want to roll like that. I don't want to do that. No, 
No, and it, it puts it all on you, and that's where a lot of that, like you said, that's where a lot of that anxiety comes from. You know, that there's, I, I, I don't feel right. I ought to do something about it. I don't know what to do. I feel, you know, boom, anxiety just kind of, you know, levels itself up on top of that. And, and yeah, that's a lot of it is coming back to, you know, what does God say? Well, he's going to, he's going to feed you. He's going to clothe you. He's going to make sure you're taken care of. You need to be pursuing him, but you don't got to be freaking out about it. And, uh, and like you said, some basic things, exercise, get outside, you know, make a big difference. How do you guys do talking about, um, like taboo subjects? Like, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, like you said, you mentioned pornography and stuff like that. There's a lot of guys that come from the Christian world and they want to be a part of a group of guys, but the stuff that needs to be talked about, maybe they grew up saying, oh, we don't talk about this. Or especially in a Christian circle of men, we don't talk about it. They actually might feel more comfortable talking about stuff with non-Christian guys because they feel mm-hmm. like they're not going to be judged. How do you guys deal with, you know, kind of addressing things that people may think, oh, it's, you know, taboo, we don't talk about these addictions, we don't talk about these sins or lust or whatever the the deal happens to be we just do it you know i mean i think i think that does make some people nervous especially given your background you know giving you know um not every guy uses the nicest language not every guy is is flowery with what he says um and that's that's the beauty of it i'm not the police officer of of the communities or anything we say hey we love all the things other men love we love sex with our wife we love sports i remember when i first started this i didn't want to talk about sports because i felt like sports you know the way we love no sports for us as a family has become like we do a tailgate experience and we have so we talk about you know you want to talk about addiction we're going to talk about uh, you know racism we're going to talk and we talk from a biblical perspective I don't care what the culture is telling me about any of these topics. Uh, yeah. the, the Bible never told me that the culture was supposed to affect my theology. The, mm-hmm. the Bible tells me I look at world through the biblical worldview and I say, okay, what does scripture tell me? Where do I see that? The condition of the human heart hasn't changed over time. And it doesn't matter where you and I could go on the planet right now. We're going to find people just like us. We're going to find people who are quote unquote good in their mind. We're going to find people who are just pure evil, the whole spectrum. I mean, none of that stuff has changed. So for us, we just we just got to get into it because, and I'll tell guys this, especially if it's a hard conversation, you know, if someone's living with their girlfriend, if someone is doing something, we owe this to you. You may not like it. And in, you know, 10 years from now, you may still be mad at me or 10 years from now, you may say, hey man, I'm thankful to have that conversation, but I owe this to you. And I will say most of the time, it doesn't go well. Most of the time that person gets upset and then they, you know, you're bad and that's fine. But I owe it to a responsibility to tell you the truth as coded in love as I can with as much grace as possible, letting you know that, hey, I'm no better than you. But this is, you know, what the Bible says. So we try to just have those conversations. You know, the very first challenge of this session of tribe with 80 guys and 40, some of them are new. It was like, what sin is crouching at your door? Well, 40 new guys had to go. Am I going to say what? Yeah. And I'd say a number of them did. There were some guys that said, I have never told this to anyone else. Um, and here they're telling it into their cell phone that are going to post in this group, assuming we're all going to keep it to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And I know there's guys that thought, nope, I don't know any of these guys. I'm not telling them anything. So we provide the opportunity. We're going to have real conversations. We're going to talk about real things. And um, that's what we call it. We just call them opportunities. And if you want to lean into it, that's great. Our, our Zoom call topics, they vary all the time. Um, because if we don't do it, who is going to have that conversation? If yeah. we don't talk about this stuff, where are they going to find it? And the only place they will find it will be through their television or through a YouTube channel or through whatever. Probably not with a biblical worldview in it. Yep. Yep. And that's that's a big part of it. The, the vacuum exists. You know, the vacuum that men feel because we don't have the fathers in our lives and those kinds of things. We don't have the examples of manhood that, that we, we really need. So that vacuum exists. It's going to get filled by something. You know, and guys are trying to fill it with porn and that kind of stuff. But there's going to be industries out there that try to fill it um, for their own sake that are not going to give guys really what they truly, truly need, which is, hey, you need to get your, your life right with Christ. You need to start aligning your values with his values, not just, you know, being a better guy than you were yesterday, those kinds of things. And um, and so I think that's that's key. And, and this kind of goes back to where we began the conversation. You know, you've got to you've got to have you've got to have a standard and, the, and Christ mm-hmm. is that standard. Mm-hmm. If the standard is just, yeah, I live with my girlfriend, you know, I, I do these things, we, you know, I party on the weekends, I, I whatever. But hey, at least I'm not a, uh, a total loser like my dad. <laughs> well, look, right. great, great. You compared yourself to the worst person that you could think of. You know, you, you came out ahead. You're always going to do that. But if you start thinking about Christ, now the standard's real high. 
and you really got something to shoot for. A lot of grace there still uh, to, to grow and all that kind of stuff, but it's still something that needs to be called out. And so, yeah, like you said, you got to do that. You got to, you got to tell guys, I owe this to you. I thought I think it's a great, great way of putting that. I think every guy, not every guy, I think that's a sweeping statement. I think there's a lot of men who have a dad issue somewhere. I think there's a, there's a male issue somewhere. And one of the things that I've learned through the years is for men specifically, we get our idea about God, the father in heaven, that big guy upstairs, whatever word you want to use for, but mm -hmm. God almighty in heaven from our earthly father. So I look at my earthly father and say, well, that must be what God is like. And so I look at God, what I think God is like, and I compare it to my earthly father. That's not fair to either one of them. No. You know, we're all fallible as, as much as I'm trying to show my kids the, the love of Christ and understand who God is. And we do Bible time and all that. I fail miserably compared to God, the father. So what we try to do is say, we get that. We understand that we can work through that, but let's get you an accurate picture of who God really is. And we get that best through Jesus, who is the logos, the very words, thoughts, emotions of, of God communicating truly, truly. I say to you, all those phrases that he tells you about the kingdom, yeah. he's telling you because he knows. Yeah. And I know you think, you know, and I know grandma brought you to Sunday school or VBS years. I know you believe all that. But let's get in scripture and let's tell you what the Bible says. And then we ask you, what do you do with that? Because only you can decide how you how you respond to that. Yeah. Yeah, 100 percent Well, Jarrett, man, this has been a great conversation. I think we could go all day on this kind of stuff <laughs> because we're really just digging into what does it mean to be a man? What does it look like to be a Christian man? Those kinds of things. And obviously, if this was something we could sum up in a conversation, we wouldn't be having a wouldn't have mm -hmm. podcasts and you know and tribe and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think what you're doing is really good, man. I think uh, I wish you the best of luck. I, I'm excited about just kind of keeping up with mm -hmm. how things progress with with that, and um, uh, and uh, just I've enjoyed having the conversation. I know we'll have many more down the road, and uh, I appreciate you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, man, and, and keep uh, keep helping guys to point towards Christ and to to better themselves and be more like Him. I think it's. It's the Lord's work. Sometimes I say that jokingly, yeah. but it really is. <laughs> Mike, thank you, man. As I said in the beginning, you've been kind to me. You've been a great example of what it means to do things with excellence, to do things consistently over time. You've been authentic with your content and your conversations, and uh, we need more men doing what you're doing as well. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it.